everyone. This is Amanda Borchel Dan. And I'm Jessica Steinberg. Your host for Times Will Tell. A weekly podcast from the Times of Israel. Hello, Times Will Tell listeners. This week, we are speaking with Abby Dalberstern and Robbie Gringrass, two Israel-based educators. Abby has worked as an educator and organizational leader for more than 20 years in the States and in Israel. Robbie is a British-born Israeli writer, performer, and educator. They are longtime professional collaborators, and they've just written a book, Stories for the Sake of Argument, a collection of 24 tales designed to provoke disagreements about Israel and other subjects. The aim is to teach readers more about themselves, each other, and the world at large. And from my reading of it, the stories address various controversial issues out there, such as religious freedom in Israel, the security barrier, issues that take place on social media, praying at the Kotel, Arab-Israeli voting issues, refugees, racial profiling. Really, the list goes on. There's even an argument about cats in Israel, which I was charmed by, in a sense, and we can talk more about that later. (laughs) And I will turn this over to Robbie and Abby. Hello to you both. Hello. Hi there. I'm wondering, as I always do when I read something for an interview, is what was the genesis of this? Because you write in the foreword that it was Abby's mother who saw potential in your early stories. And I was thinking, I wonder what that what, what is the story behind that? So I don't know if it's Robbie or Abby who's going to tell the story about that, but one of you first needs to tell me that little piece of information. Well, it's, that actually isn't starting from the beginning. So we'll, we'll, uh, but I'll tell that and then Robbie can go back to the actual beginning. <laughs> but that there was, might be, we were, yeah. Yeah, there might be. After we wrote a few stories, in fact, I sent it to my mother, Antoinette, um, which her name already, you know, is, is subject of commentary. But um, I, I sent it to my mother as um, all of us in the family who have written things um, sent to my mother. She's been editing me, whether it was high school papers, college papers, and beyond for many years. And I sent her these. And my mom, um, who is a, mar- a master of marketing, among other things, said, you're on to something. Keep going. And then she had all these other ideas. So <laughs> that's, that's my mom. All right, so then who's going to tell us what the genesis of the book was? Robbie, you want to take a turn? Sure, sure. The, I mean, the, the stories themselves, they emerge from Israel education work, and in particular working with young adults, and even more in particular working with an organization called Moisha House, a uh, fantastic organization for young adults. Uh, uh, we were working at the time with young adults in America when I was sort of going global, um, working with them on Israel education. And it was a realization that in order to have meaty, meaningful conversations about Israel. Uh, You have to risk actually disagreeing with each other. Um, And that kind of went, we we might say, it kind of went opposite to the culture of Moisha House, where they have this brilliant thing where in their retreats, uh, if somebody is observing Shabbat in a way in which they would like someone else to respect or something, rather than having to go into a full explanation about it, they just have this thing where they say, Shabbos yo. And Shabbos yo means, you know, let's not go into it. It's just, it's a Shabbos thing. Um, and what we realized, and this was with one of our co-educators, a woman called uh, um, Lauren Cohen Fisher, is that conversations about Israel actually were about Israel oi, that the, the, the yo is, is inverted. So the whole idea of, of Shabbos yo is we may not agree about the way in which we mark Shabbat, so let's not talk about it. Let's just accept it and move on. Whereas with Israel education, we want people to be saying about Israel, we may not agree. So let's definitely talk about it. And let's definitely explore the ways in which we disagree so that we can actually learn about different perspectives on this place. How did you even possibly choose from among the many scenarios and arguments that one can find in everyday life in Israel? Abby, you want to take a stab at that? Sure. So I want to just back up for one second and say it's very important to mention that the context of, of that work with Moisha House and also the writing of the book um, was from a grant from the Jim Joseph Foundation to Makom at the Jewish Agency for Israel. Um, Robbie and I have, have now gone independent, but it's important to say that's also the context of the, when we were thinking about all this. In terms of how we um, thought about the stories, um, some of it started quite naturally, just 
they're on our mind all the time. Rami and I teach this stuff all the time where we live in Israel, we think about Israel. And so some of it was just quite natural. But as we started going through it, we had two frameworks we were using um, in order to make sure that we touched a well-rounded um, uh, a view on Israel, right? to make sure that we really saw different aspects of Israel through these stories. The first one um, was by a, a writer that probably many of your listeners know, named Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, um, in his book, uh, Righteous Mind, um, where he talks about different uh, moral palettes um, or different ways of seeing the world um, that people who are more leaning to the left or more leaning to the right that they see, and that there are different values that are that, that we all have, and some people weight one value or a few values more than others. So just as one example, justice and fairness. Um, somebody, one person might think justice is more important and somebody else might think fairness is more important. And they're in conversation with each other, but they're not the same thing. Um, and so we use, he has, he has different more pal- palettes, and we, we use those um, to make sure that we were touching on different aspects of society. So that's one framework we used. And the other framework we used was something that Ravi was really key to developing during um, when he worked for Makom, which, was, um, which is a framework, framework called the four Hatikva questions. And on, on, one foot, the, the, on one foot, the quick overview of what that is, it takes the second to last line of the Hatikva, to be a people free in our land. Israel's national anthem is the Hatikva. Just going to point that out. Thank you. It takes Israel's national anthem, the Hatikva, and um, the second to last line, the Yot Am Chofshi Beretzenu, and um, to, to be a people free in our lands, and asks four exis- existential questions. What does it mean to be? What is security, right? To be having to do with security. Um, how do we live a life of security? Um, what, what, is, what is a people? Who are my people? What is it to be free? And what is my land? What are all the questions having to do with my territory? And we made sure that the book and the stories looked at all four of those um, parts of Israeli life, but also what turns out to be quite an existential, um, those four, four existential questions that exist everywhere. So now that I'm hearing what you're saying and thinking back to what I've read from the book, you really distill this into uh, very clarifying, clear arguments that as I understood, could really be used by people of many ages. And, and that the stories themselves, um, it's kind of, it's always difficult to have a conversation about Israel in general, right? And things will always spill over into many different areas. And so one of the values of using a specific story about a specific situation for specific people um, means that, first of all, the argument doesn't spill everywhere. We're talking about one aspect. We can kind of, to an extent, isolate things. And the other fun thing is that, of course, the moment you get into the details, then it's much more difficult to hold a dogmatic line. Right. I always believe in this, but actually, when we've got this situation, then that might be a little bit more complicated. I it is important for me that women are always represented on stage. But if that means that a huge charity can't look after ill people, then I've got values in in contrast with each other. And then I'm sort of, I have to not give up on, but I need to be aware that I might have to compromise on my my dogma. And all of us have them. And then there's an interesting conversation which starts up when you get into the nitty gritty and the, the complexities into the real life. Even though they're fiction, even though they're fictional stories, <laughs> right? So they're fictional stories, but of course they are very much rooted in what is going on in Israeli society. So come back to that now. How did you choose your scenarios? How did you choose these arguments among all the various arguments that are out there? Give us a sense of your work process. So I wonder if Rami and I will have slightly different answers. Um, <laughs> so, but but I'll start, which is sometimes. You know, it's a, it's a creative process. Sometimes you sit down, you think you sit down, you think you have a story, you start writing, and God, it just didn't work. And I tried, <laughs> and I edited, and I re-edited, and then Robbie tried to edit. There are a few stories like that, and it just didn't it just didn't work. Um, so some of it was really just like that. Occasionally, we'd read an article and say, "Ah, oh, here's one." Something there were a few that we felt, at least I felt, were were too fresh. So I'll give an example of one that's not in there that maybe we'll write or somebody else might want to write. Ben and Jerry's and ice cream. 
Should we buy Ben and Jerry's ice cream, right? Should we buy Ben and Jerry's ice cream? While we were writing, it was still fresh and felt like it would be so obvious. And maybe we should we change it to a different food? Let's give a little context to that one. Just to remind listeners that Unilever, which owns Ben and Jerry's, the Vermont-based ice cream manufacturer, which has had an Israeli presence for, I think, three decades, uh, they decided that they weren't going to allow Ben and Jerry's to be sold in anywhere over Israel's green line. In other words, in the West Bank and Gaza. I don't know if Ben and Jerry's has ever been sold in Gaza. Uh, not that they couldn't use it because who couldn't use good ice cream? But any in any case, going back to Ben and Jerry's. And so that has created this whole controversy about Ben and Jerry's only being sold in Israel proper. And do people want to even buy Ben and Jerry's anymore? Back to you, Abby. Right. Um, so just as an example, we didn't include that because it felt maybe a little too soon. Um, so that was one. But another another um, measure we used, and this is, does not have to do with Ben and Jerry's, another measure that was very important was if Robbie and I couldn't argue both sides. Ah. It's not to say that we didn't have an opinion, meaning I have an opinion on most of these stories, but if I couldn't actually see the other side, um, and we're fairly open-minded, pluralistic people who that's our job is to see and to teach multiple sides. If we couldn't see the other side, then we didn't include it. Because the story has to work as a story, right? And it needs to be something which I grapple over. And so a lot of it was also sort of taking a headline and trying to personalize it. Okay, we understand the issue, let's say, with women at the wall. Now let's imagine a person or people there and what they're going through. And what if there were the Haredi ultra-Orthodox woman who is praying at the Kotel at the same time as women at the wall? What's she thinking, believing, feeling? And giving voice to these additional sides to stuff so that there can actually be a conversation rather than uh, preaching to the choir. Uh, so always it was it was looking for the personal and the human beings in it. And the other thing was trying to uh, create a story. We, we found us it was there was almost something formulaic about making sure that there's no compromise available. Because so often we enter into discussions or, or disagreements, either because I have to convince you that you're wrong, or that we're going to solve it together. And the thing is that l- the learning really comes when we can't solve things, and we do need to live with and deal with our disagreements. And if you're in a situation where there's not a compromise available, no, you can't sell half the house. You either sell the house or you don't sell the house. There needs to be a decision made. And then again, we move into that whole, I can have my principles, but when it comes to the real real time, I can't hold it easily. I need to make a stand. And making a stand will inevitably mean that I may well, may well disagree with somebody else. And then it's like living with that. Right. We actually disagree as human beings. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. back with Abby Dabber Stern and Robbie Gringrass, the Israel-based educators who are the, also the authors of the new book, Stories for the Sake of Argument. You've both lived here for a long time. You both come from other countries originally. There are certain stories that are extremely Israel-based, others that are more universal. And arguing in Israel is part of daily life sometimes. It's the reason I don't, and I order my groceries online. I don't go to the supermarket because I don't want to (laughs) enter into that situation. But it happens when you drive your car. It can happen when you're walking down the street. You're laughing because we all know what this is like. So I was curious for each of you, which story really resonated and was perhaps the most difficult and meaningful and because of that? I think for me, Demands of History, which is a, st- is a story about uh, whether an older couple should sell some of their own land that's been in their family for generations in order to help their son um, who really needed who really needed it. And it's an analogy very much for should Israel give land to Palestinians in order to, to make life better uh, for all of us, really. Um, and that hit close to home. We we explain in the background there that it also has, that that there's an analogy that can be made to um, to Rachel's uh, Rachel or, or uh, matriarch uh, to her her tomb, um, which is sort of in is in Bethlehem, but 
Israelis can get in and there's a major compromise that's been made to get to that tomb. And for me, that that is very resonant because it's such a complex issue to be able to say, okay, we'll just give up this very um, clearly principal part of our story, part of our, our ancestors, part of my family, to give up part of my family story um, for the sake of, of, of something else that I might benefit from too, right, for, for peace. But to give that up feels just really huge. And I personally am very torn by both sides and can see both arguments in that one. Um, also because it's a stone's throw away from where I live, perhaps, um, that, that feels hard. As the crow flies. Robbie, how about you? Yeah. I think there are quite a few of them which which I connect to. I, I, I guess I'd, I'd talk about the story called racial profiling, which is uh, f- told from the first person of a security guard at the entrance to a mall, who um, at a time of high high security risks needs to look at people standing in line about to come into the come into the mall, and somebody who looks dark, unshaven nervous, perhaps with cheaper clothes, he must take that person aside because that person may have a bomb and isn't going to wait for him to ask him whether he does have a bomb. Uh, and at the same time, he, know- he knows that this is outrageous to be racially profiling people. Then he shares with the reader that he himself looks like that exactly, because he himself is of Mizrahi background. Mm-hmm. He's dark skinned. He hasn't shaven today. He's pretty nervous in the job. And actually, he knows that were he to approach him at the security checkpoint, he would stop himself. Um, and that whole mixture of, of ethnicities, my wife is of Yemenite and, uh, and Moroccan origin. My son is constantly stopped by the police because he's darker skinned. And those complexities of racial profiling and also wanting to be safe, and also wanting to be fair, and also dealing with our own internal um, identity crises within Israel for Arab Jews. Yeah, that one, that one often churns me up. Yeah, I can imagine. Rob, you also write at some point in the book that you're terrible at arguments. I am as well, actually. My kids always tell me I need to get better at it. And I don't know if, Abby, if you feel the same way or if you're really good at arguing, but did this process of really thinking about what an argument is and, as you've said, what can come out of it, did that change for you at all? Does it make you think differently just about the most generic arguments in one's life? A couple of things have helped. What One has been to learn how to differentiate between the argument where I need to correct you, the argument where I need to fix something, and the argument where we're just in, where we're in this to learn and there's benefit in that, even if I don't convince you, and even if we don't solve it. That's helped for me to clarify, actually, when we're talking about taking the garbage out, that's not a learning conversation. I just need to take the bloody garbage out. You know, that's, <laughs> you know, I just need to do the right thing. But so that, that's, that's been helpful, certainly. Yeah. What about you, Abby? Yeah. So I am... Um... I think I'm okay at arguments, although you probably ask uh, people who are close to me. I don't know, um, <laughs> but but I would say that the research that that we did for the book and that now we're actually doing a lot more of. Um, one of the things I'm finding myself is asking different kinds of questions um, to change the direction of the argument. So just this morning, somebody was was telling me something, um, and it was clear he was just stuck on the same point, and he kept repeating it. And I suddenly used this moment and said, wait a second, he needs a different question. He needs to be asked something to open up a different way of thinking for him. He's trying to convince me of this point. And okay, whether I'm convinced or not, but he needs a different kind of question so that I understand him better because I wasn't understanding. And so I I am starting to use uh, more and more tools, especially as we're reading more and more books on the subject. Okay. That's good. That's good fodder. So now, so tell me a little bit about what you just said. So now the book is out. And what is the plan for using it, for utilizing it, for getting it out there, for how you guys want to use it and move forward with it? We um, are offering workshops, uh, some to, to, to train people on how to use it and how to practice these different tools. Um, we have several partnerships uh, with different organizations. Um, and I'd say most importantly, and I think what we're most excited about, is to do further research on the subject. We've thankfully gotten um, some funding to really look at these practices that we're teaching, that we're saying, yes, if you teach Israel 
and other subjects, if we teach towards the argument rather than teach towards the consensus, right, teach towards the argument, what does that change? How does that impact on students? How does that impact on families? How does that impact on discourse, largely speaking? And how do we teach that? What are the practices that need to be taught? What are, what are um, uh, the tools that need to be given in order to do that? But also then what are, what's the impact? So we're planning to be partnering um, probably with uh, a few academics as well as with um, program evaluation team to help us think through um, and learn, not just for ourselves, but really to hopefully help change how discourse more broadly is used. Um, as we know, that trends today of polarization, um, which we all hear too much about, uh, the calling out, rather calling in, the cancel culture, um, that, that there's something in the world that needs real fixing and real, addre- real addressing. And so we're hoping that through this project, we can begin to, to touch some of those issues um, and make some change, specifically in educational settings, but also hopefully more broadly. So I, I suppose I'm, I'm going to go for, for brute stereotypes, which are kind of <laughs> true. And we're talking in real life, not online, because arguments online are a different animal and we're, we're, we're not there yet. That's, that's a much larger one to address. But in real life, the general stereotype is that working with young American Jews, they're very good at listening and really, really frightened of giving their own opinion. Whereas in Israel, they're very good at giving their own opinion and not so great at listening. And we have a feeling that we need to work on both. Uh, there's a lot of work about increasing our, improving our listening skills, and without doubt, that's really important. But we also need to improve our giving uh, our, our own voice, giving our voice in a way that still leaves room for the other person, but actually saying what we mean and clarifying our differences uh, rather than papering over the cracks the whole time. Because I think that the papering over the cracks, in particular when we're talking about Israel, that doesn't work anymore. Um, Israel isn't. A matter of consensus, neither inside Israel or outside Israel, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a crisis. That may be that the uh, out of the cracks, the learning emerges. Not necessarily, not only the light. We're focused on English speakers predominantly in North America at okay. this stage. Um, yeah. I will say that that I've already gotten requests to have the book translated into Hebrew, um, and uh, I'd love to have the book translated into Hebrew. It's there's some cultural translation needed as well, but um, in general, the stories also could be very useful um, for, I think, a lot of uh, Israeli uh, for, for Israeli populations. And the main thing is to to, to get the book out, um, and that's that's the thing that we're really into is that the there are organisations who are buying hundreds of books for their for all their people, and it's on Amazon right now. And to have the book out there, it's not something that we're sort of the way that the structure is. It's not we're not going to be making huge money by book sales. But we're hopefully we're going to be making significant uh, impact or influence by people having the arguments. If maybe it's a bar mitzvah boys present. Maybe it's that thing that the, the 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 parent is bringing because we sit around the table and everyone's looking at their screens rather than having conversations. It's that sort of influence that we're really looking forward to. There are two uh, directions this book goes in, or our work goes in. One is addressing arguments and how do we have better ones. But another is how do we learn about Israel? And so. It's a very important thing to say, and we didn't say it earlier, which is that the idea that learning about Israel can, can be much more interesting when we ignite people's passions. And that means getting into the things that we argue over. And so for whether that's at a family or youth movement or, or school, if we avoid the, 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 that complex stuff that gets us angry or excited, most likely we're teaching the stuff that's boring. So it's also about how do we teach the interesting stuff, but how do we create the right containers um, and pedagogy is so that people aren't afraid to get into it. Thank you so much, Robbie and Abby, for being with us on this week's Times Will Tell. We were very happy to have you with us. We're very happy to be here. Thanks for having us. We'll be back tomorrow with a daily briefing. Thanks for now. Happy listening and be well. Thanks so much for listening to Times Will Tell from the Times of Israel. And thanks to our producer, Gilad Brownstein. Please subscribe wherever you find your podcast and check out our daily briefing news show every Sunday through Thursday. Like what you hear? Consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to spread the word. Until next week. Shalom. Shalom.